my biggest surprise was being asked to do the job. It was a welcome surprise, a happy accident, if you like. My biggest surprise was to notice how, when I was able to go beyond the head-to-head -head conversation and have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, how do we turn up in the world as humans? Those conversations were transformative. What is very clear is that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that you can achieve if you are acting alone. I was there for the adoption of the Convention. 92, I was there for the adoption of the Kyoto Protocol. There was a lot of backroom dealing and putting people together and keeping people out. And in the end, the, the masterly chairperson of the negotiations, Raul Estrada Oyuela of Argentina, brought his hammer down. And I was happy. My friends and colleagues were happy. I, I think the time in Bali when we managed to agree the Bali Action Plan, because that was really the moment when we tore down the Berlin Wall of Climate Action, when we really said, you know, it, yes, it's definitely true that industrialized countries cause this problem. It's definitely true that industrialized nations need to take their responsibility uh, and to help poorer brothers and sisters to, to engage on this topic and change their economic model. How does one reconcile the need to act against climate change with the need to get out of poverty? And that, that is, is still an underlying issue as, as we go along. How does one address the environmental problem, to call it that, um, at the same time as allowing people, encouraging people, permitting people to get out of absolute poverty? That, to me, has always been a fundamental issue. At the end of the day, we can only succeed together. We all need to engage. Our challenge is the negotiating process, uh, and our challenge as a secretariat, which, which facilitates that, is to find the way to do that, to enable that global engagement. I had the um, pleasure of assuming the responsibility for the international negotiations six months after Copenhagen, and it was a very dark moment for climate. And I think there was a conclusion that a global treaty on climate would never be possible. In fact, I remember clearly that at my first uh, press conference, someone asked me, a journalist asked me, so Ms. Figueres, do you think a global climate agreement will ever be possible? And I said, no, not in my lifetime. There was a general conclusion that it would not be possible. So um, I, I remember leaving the, the press conference room, having decided that I would prove myself wrong and that I would dedicate my efforts and all of my focus to making a global agreement possible. There's a saying in the English language and probably in many other languages as well, that where there is a, a will, there is a way. And I felt throughout my UNFCCC tenure and ever since that we need to turn that saying around and in fact, maybe conclude that where there is a way, there is a will. What I mean by that is that I feel that there is today pretty much a, a universal commitment to the challenge of climate change and the need to act on it, but that many political leaders and many corporate leaders and many people in the, in the public don't yet see the way. They don't yet see how they can act on this global challenge of climate change, while at the same time grow their economies, protect their lifestyles, um, win the next election or get the corporate bonus that they're hoping for. So a big part of the challenge that's still ahead of us, I think, is to show that it is actually possible to do what we all feel is, um, is, is morally right. Without trust, there is no possibility of having collective action. 
and in a, in a process that involves uh, almost 200 countries with such diverse realities and also multiple stakeholders from different entities, uh, that means that uh, you find very frequently uh, competing interests. But at the same time, in order to make this uh, common uh, sense of action prevail, you need to find the right balance between the interest of all those art actors. And that is required in order to preserve trust. The phase that we're in is, is very much the era of, of, of action and understanding how we can actually do what we all feel we, we need to be doing. And one of the important things to think about is, is how the role of the UNFCCC changes in the context of, of those different phases. And I, I very much see the challenge of the Secretariat, uh, of the process, of, of the people that attend the COPS in, in networking to, to build the possible. We have strengthened what we call inclusive multilateralism which uh, is making the process more inclusive, uh, allowing many stakeholders from different uh, areas to participate, to participate actively. I think this is very important, not only because the transformation that needs to happen requires to have every single person on board, but also because um, it is uh, uh, necessary that they get a sense of ownership of the process. It is not only the governments. It, the governments alone cannot get this transformation. The moment I will never forget is uh, the moment the gavel came down when Minister Favius uh, brought the gavel down on the adoption of the Paris Agreement and uh, it took me a few seconds to internalize that that was it, that the Paris Agreement had been adopted. And then as I jumped to my out of my seat, um, I locked eyes with two sets of people. One was my two daughters sitting in the front seat and the second was the secretary and staff that was lining the plenary hall way in the back. And I was just filled with such gratitude for the unbelievable work that those people had done during years. And I knew that this was very likely the most important moment for them as well. The positive things I see coming out of the, the post-Paris process is the broadening of engagement, more and more parties, more and more players becoming involved, and the UNFCCC process becoming much less a sort of closed door intergovernmental thing, and much more an open process that allows multiple societal players to engage. Today, the participation of many stakeholders is just par for the court. We are seeing so much more transition capacity outside of national governments. We had so many different coalitions that came together in order to support governments. That, and that was the whole point. It wasn't to criticize governments or blame them or hit them over the head, quite the contrary. It was to support the efforts of governments. And today that has grown into being a very well accepted and very highly uh, frequented part of COPS and, of course, throughout the year. Climate change is not just a matter for the environment minister. Climate change is for the whole government. It affects the whole way that the economy and society works. If governments get their act together, especially the major emitters, and steer the economy in the right direction, there's hope, but it will take time. The other side is a much greater emphasis on accountability, on making sure that people are doing what they are saying that they are doing. And that isn't just governance, it would have to extend beyond. I am convinced that addressing climate change in a timely fashion is not a matter of faith or hope. It is a matter of decision. It is a matter of choice 
It is a matter of courage. It is a matter of standing up precisely, precisely because we've run out of time. It's about standing up, having the courage precisely at these moments when we have so much bad news that is pouring over us. This is the moment when we have that responsibility. Every single one of us who is alive and especially alive as an adult right now has the responsibility to stand up and show up and do what needs to be done. So this is not about hope. This is about courage. This is about doing what needs to be done.